Hi, Sibi. I think you should be able to start your video now. Hi, Ali. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sibi, and I'm a final year student at National Law School, Bangalore. I'm absolutely delighted to invite you to this panel discussion on the 74th UN Day, marking the 76th anniversary of the entry into force of the Charter of the United Nations. This panel discussion on constitutional make, constitution making and international law, exploring the role and effect of the UN in Afghanistan, is organized in collaboration by two student bodies at NLS, the Law and Society Committee, and the Council for International Relations and International Law. I'd like to congratulate the organizers for bringing together a panel comprising top notch scholars from three diverse fields of law. And we are very positive that their insights will help all participants today. And I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce them. Our first panelist, Ms. Azim Tajsini, works at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She holds a PhD from the Department of Public and International Law, University of Oslo. And her research work focuses on the political and constitutional changes in Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq. Our next panelist, Professor Amal Sethi, is currently a senior fellow at the Faculty of Law, University of Hamburg. He holds a doctorate and master's in law from the University of Pennsylvania, and his research work focuses on comparative constitutional studies uh, with an emphasis on courts, democracy, and constitutions. And our final panelist, Ms. Abhimanyu Georgian, is a public international lawyer who's currently working as a research associate at the Laws and War Crimes Project. He is also a PhD candidate at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies at Geneva. The UN Day is internationally celebrated across the world, um, holding meetings and discussions um, on the accolades and achievements of the organization. This panel discussion is more aspirational in that sense because it seeks to explore how an organization enjoying the stature and the re recognition that the UN does can intervene and help ameliorate this crisis, political crisis in Afghanistan after the Taliban took over the country on August 15 this year. Uh, I'd not like to take any more time, but during the session, if the, partic the participants are welcome to send in any questions they have using the chat function and, that, and, these, and they can be taken up in the Q&A session towards the later part of the discussion. I'd like to now invite Professor Amal to open the discussion. Professor, as the Taliban announces to temporarily adopt the 1964 constitution, a document that was in force for all of barely nine years, how do you envisage that they will practice the constitution? And as they announced to also draft a new constitution, which would be the country's seventh, if I'm not wrong, what kind of a constitution making process can we expect? And what role and influence can the UN have, if any? So, uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for putting this panel and for, for inviting me. So, to your question, I'll I'll say this: that I I don't expect the Taliban really at this stage to kind of engage in a democratic constitution making process, the kind. Uh, that follows best practices where different groups in a society, they come together and they, they negotiate a so-called contract and everyone's demands are kind of, uh, you know, fulfilled, or at least if they, they're not able to, they are deferred for the future. Uh, the Taliban is going to kind of, uh, this is my opinion, and I might be completely wrong. It, they will kind of, their new constitution, whatever it will be, will be, a kind of a constitution which is very centralized, which centralizes a lot of power, which will be based on the kind of governance structures uh, that they exercised when they were in power prior to 2001. And uh, so I think to the question, what role can the UN play? We need to kind of go a step back. In such situations, what can the UN do when you have regimes which are rogue? Uh, the standard practice that the UN does is they'll impose sanctions, they'll pass resolutions which uh, will condemn these actions. In recent years, what we've seen with regimes like the Taliban or any other regime which kind of, uh, you could classify as a rogue regime, you could classify as an illiberal regime, whatever you want to classify it as. Whenever such kind of things have happened, when you've, UN has imposed sanctions, when uh, um, UN has passed resolutions, they haven't always worked in most cases. Um, I'm going a little off track, but uh, 
there's a really good example from Uganda where uh, there was this dormant law very similar to our section 377, though it, it definitely imposed much harsher provisions. It was never enforced. No one ever spoke about it in the country. And suddenly you had a lot of international, out of nowhere, you had the international community discussing it. There was some, uh, not a main security council resolution, but there were other UN bodies that kind of condemned that. What that kind of actually resulted was that Uganda's like, who are these uh, Western powers here who are, are dictating to us how to run our country? And they actually clamped uh, even ahead and were like, we are going to import, import, start enforcing this law. So this is what I feel that if if you push very hard with them, this is going. This is what I feel their response would be. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems that happened when you know, kind of Taliban was driven out in 2001 was kind of this overconfidence that they're gone for good. Um, and also another very important thing that kind of, it was kind of like, you could say an arrogance from the West that they could create a society where they barely involve actually a lot of other actors, not just the Taliban, a lot of one thing which is very fascinating about Afghanistan, which we barely end up speaking, is that 2001 or even before the events of August, uh, the central government only controlled 30 percent of its territory. The rest of the territory is under the command of local militias and warlords. Um, and when the 2004 constitution was made, a lot of these people who had actual uh, on ground control were sidelined. Um, so the thing is that, um, you know, now there are actually power holders in Afghanistan. If the international community, if the UN, um, they want to engage, it has to be at least at some level where you kind of do meet the terms of the people who hold power. You can't just be like, you know what, we are not going to cooperate with you. Um, this is what we are going to do. Uh, we're going to put sanctions on you. That has over time proven not to be the most effective of strategies and also goes back to thinking like what's what is the economy of Afghanistan currently and 50% of the economy is illegal drug trade, poppy production. Uh, the Taliban and, and that's how they've been kind of uh, funding the economy as well as you know, funding from other governments who are vested with this. They, this is my hunch that they will continue that. And this, this will be a very tough time for, you know, the international community organizations like UN to kind of really, you know, um, kind of exert to try and show that they matter and they can, in the toughest of circumstances, they can make a difference. So any form of dialogue really has to be a mutual dialogue, which does involve people who actually exercise power. Um, you know, for all the things um, that I've, uh, I would criticize about the previous American administration, one thing that I, I won't say they did it right, because a lot of people in Afghanistan, they do believe that the US uh, removal of forces were very premature, but they engaged in negotiations with Taliban, recognizing that they're a force in a country. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very different thing how you want to look at it. Uh, but that is something that you have to keep in mind. They are the ones who are running the country. They exercise power. And there are some other, other regional militias and groups that also have power. So any future dialogues do need to kind of take them into account. But again, just I'll, I've gone on a uh, kind of a long detour. But going back to your um, initial question that the Taliban has been very vocal about the 2004 constitution. They have time and again called it the biggest obstacle to peace in Afghanistan. There are already some rough drafts out which uh, are available to journalists and other people of the kind of system Taliban wants to create. It's going to be a hardline Islamic constitution. It's going to be a constitution that uh, kind of centralizes power in the few um, um, upper leaders of Taliban. Um, it is not at all liberal in any way in terms of providing rights. That is the constitution they want. And if any other negotiations need to happen, uh, you can't expect them to budge a lot from the idea that they want this really hardline Islamic constitution. 
Uh, convincing them, at least in the short term, is going to be a very difficult thing. It might be a very long run process where you kind of try to, you know, uh, deal with them and tell them. And I don't know how rational that is because a lot of people would actually say that they aren't rational actors who aren't ever going to engage in proper discourse. But it has to be a long run process where you kind of, you know, try to convince the power holders on the ground that being a part of the international community is favorable for you. Uh, you know, we'll cooperate with you if you cooperate with us. Uh, don't be that harsh when it comes to uh, rights of women, education, etc. So it has to be a long, this is my opinion, I think it has to be a long run process. And every every international actor involved needs to realize it's going to take time and force is not going to be done. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your comments, Professor. Um, but also just a small follow up on that question. Um, do you think uh, what kind of a process will um, be undertaken in coming up with the text of the constitution? Do you think it would be inclusive, diverse? Because there are, um, I'm not sure if they're misfounded, but, uh, uh, but anticipation of a good Taliban regime as well. One, because now that they're, part, they're, in, they're in power, they might want to act with more accountability and responsibility. And what do you, what do you think about uh, those uh, anticipation people? So, uh... I'll answer this in two ways. One is a big part of the PR campaign uh, that Taliban kind of wants to, uh, you know, show that they are a different Taliban. But the people that are involved, the uh, even their temporary administrative officers that they have appointed to their cabinet, etc., does not show them for that. Um, a lot of them were part of this hardline terrorist group that was in Guantanamo Bay in prison, which was part of a swap deal with the Taliban, they've been given high force. Um, a lot of their on-ground activities don't show that they are going to be very different, maybe a little bit moderate, but not too much different. Now, as, far, as far as inclusive constitution making goes, this is, this is actually a very interesting thing that even democratic regimes don't do that unless there's a reason to. So if Taliban has a lot of power currently, there aren't strong opposition voices. There's no need to be inclusive. It's a very simple cost benefit kind of thing that the funny thing is since around there's a there's an empirical study by a, a political scientist by the name of Jennifer Weidner she's uh, she's undertaking this massive project on political participation in constitution making and has looked at every constitution that has been drafted since I think 74 or 1978 and there's like almost uh, 300 odd of them or at least processes that have been undertaken. Most of them democratic constitutions, just a handful of them have been authoritarian constitutions or illiberal constitutions, but only one third of them had some form of public participation. By some, I don't even mean the, the kind of normative ideal, something as simple as uh, just distributing the draft in public without you know, really caring what the public says. And even, you know, going back to the 2004 constitution, which a lot of people at that time hailed as this remarkable constitution that kind of merged uh, Islamic values with liberal values. And it was like this model template for even constitutions in the Middle East, Middle East Northern Africa, etc. Uh, there was some illusionary public participation, but very few comments uh, or, you know, concerns actually made it to the draft at that time. A lot that went into the draft was actually what the power holders at that time wanted. It's just this unfortunate reality of constitution making that that's what happens every time. Um, there have been very few processes across history where power holders have actually gone and said, okay, you know what, let's involve other actors that are, you know, important, that might be important to this country's future. Um, the very few incidents, uh, some of the most hailed constitution making processes that are kind of, you know, at least described as somewhat ideal, like the American process in 1789, even the Indian process in 1947, which were kind of driven by singular parties, uh, even when they were inclusive. Uh, and these are like some of the best examples that you can find of at least historical examples of inclusive participation. I mean, Everyone here knows about the Indian constitution making process. It was a very diverse body, but th there is still a question. Could it, it could have been more diverse. Uh, so that's the reality. I don't think that they will um, they'll engage in some kind of a normatively desirable constitution making process just very simply because they don't need to. People are self-driven actors. Absolutely. Thanks so much for answering that question and all your comments, Professor. Um, 
I'd like to invite our next panelist taking the discussion forward, uh, Ms. Abhimanyu Georgian. Um, so there is, and this is something uh, uh, Professor Amal also touched on, that there is a valid uh, popular apprehension that the constitutional text drafted by a terrorist outfit, um, what, what kind of a respect for human rights it can always such. However, for long, the instant uh, standard for respect of human rights has been that of the liberal tradition. So while all the critiques of subjective culturalism ostensibly legitimately apply to the case of Taliban, how desirable would it be to have international liberalism de determine a discernment of respect for human rights in Afghanistan? And it's taking on something uh, on the Uruguay example that Professor Amal also touched on as to how much of that external uh, imposition can be um, had to be uh, constructively received by the Taliban. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Ruby. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, fascinating discussion. I'm really pleased to be here, and uh, I think this is a very important and a very timely conversation. Um, and so, springing off of your question, I think I'd like to use the time available to me. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to answer your question in a slightly roundabout fashion, but I want to use the time uh, that I have at my disposal to sort of highlight and analyze the premises that may, are maybe underlying this discussion. Um, when we talk about the role of the UN in improving the situation in the Taliban's Afghanistan or the UN as a counter to the Taliban's excesses, we presume the evil and illegitimacy of the Taliban. Uh, we presume the virtue of the UN and we presume the desirability of the UN's intervention in Afghanistan. And what I'd like to do is examine these premises a little more closely. And to that end, I'd like to touch upon three ideas. Right? Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to explain why I believe it's important to step back and examine the premises of this discussion. Um, second, I want to question this idea of the status of the Taliban as, as evil or illegitimate. Uh, and third, I want to take a closer look at the costs and benefits of the UN's involvement. So let me start with the first of those ideas, the utility of stepping back to question the premises. We're having this discussion in a very specific context. Uh, there's a grave humanitarian crisis unfolding in Afghanistan. Uh, so it's not immediately obvious that this is a good time to stop and reflect upon the possibilities and pitfalls of international intervention. But that's precisely why it is essential to stop and reflect. The spectacle of violence demands immediate attention and resolution. It tugs at our heartstrings, it fires up our consciences. But as Zizek points out, the need to respond immediately also eliminates the possibility of reflection, of trying to understand the specificities of this particular humanitarian crisis, of adapting our intervention to this specific context. And instead, these urgent interventions end up adhering to a template, uh, repressing violence, but also reproducing and perpetuating the status quo. And this is the problem, I think, with an unreflective humanitarian response. Uh, a refusal to engage with the structural aspects of a humanitarian crisis may provide immediate am amelioration, but it really can't provide long-term improvement. We put out one fire only to have it spring up again in a slightly different place, in a slightly different way. 20 years after 9-11, what has really changed in Afghanistan? The Taliban is back in power. The situation of the Afghan people is set to revert to status quo. The only seemingly tangible result of the last 20 years seems to be the many thousands of Afghan lives, limbs, livelihoods that have been lost as collateral damage. So the durability of the state of affairs, like Amal said, the uh, return to power of the Taliban um, should prompt reflections upon its nature and causes rather than simply triggering an impasse to deny it. So this is my case for stopping and reflecting rather than rushing into ameliorate. What does this look like in practice? We absolutely must continue trying to bring food, clothes, and medicines to the Afghan people. But in going beyond immediate material needs, in trying to remedy the underlying problem, let's be careful in how we think about what the crisis is and what the response should be. When we find ourselves assuming the illegitimacy of the Taliban, despite its effective control of the country, or framing the Taliban as an evil force to be worked around or displaced, or rushing to tie Afghanistan into the existing international order, let's stop and reflect. Let's think about the tension between the effective control exercised by the Taliban and its exclusion from the international order. 
let's consider whether the coercing of Afghanistan into the international order with the carrot of development uh, is re really of benefit to the Afghan people. Right, so that brings me to the end of the first of the three ideas that I wanted, to, I wanted to touch upon, the importance of questioning the premises of our discussion. Let me move on now to the second part, which is um, the specific premise of the Taliban as evil or illegitimate. Um, now, undeniably, the Taliban is a horrifying organization. Its policies and actions are abhorrent. This is reflected in the universal refusal of states to recognize it as the government of Afghanistan. At the same time, though, it clearly is in effective control of Afghanistan. And its abhorrence did not prevent the U.S. from signing Afghanistan over to it, as Azin has argued in a blog post, nor does it stop China, Pakistan, and Russia from negotiating with it. So there's an interesting question here. How or why does the Taliban's perceived evil affect its international personality? It can't just be the fact that the Taliban systematically and egregiously violates human rights. Because if that were the case, then the, uh, the upper caste Hindu fundamentalism of the Indian government, the Chinese genocide in Xinjiang, the institutionalized racism and economic oppression in many Western countries would all be equally legitimate. But we know that they're not. What seems to set the Taliban apart is that its violation of human rights is accompanied by its contestation of the validity and applicability of those rights. And so they're not just breaching their rights, they're also disputing their existence. Saudi Arabia's systematic oppression of women is mitigated by its ratification of CEDAW. And its lip service to international humanitarian law allows the UK and the US to sell it military technologies, which they know will then be used to deliberately target civilians in Yemen. The Taliban does many of the same things, but maybe they do it more honestly, uh, without pretending that they agree with the underlying principles of the international order. So this is the nub of the matter, the particular evil or illegitimacy of the Taliban, its exclusion from international society, lies in its rejection of the fundamental principles of the international order, rather than its breach of those fundamental principles. And I'd, I'd like you to hold on to this thought um, that the Taliban's exclusion from international society results from its contestation of the international order. Just hold on to that idea for a moment. Well, I briefly introduce another idea. To Chantal Mouffe's critique of liberalism, and then I'll tie the two together. Mouffe argues that conflicts of interest between members of a society are unavoidable, right? And it is this ever present, ineradicable possibility of antagonism which defines the political realm. And liberal societies and liberal conceptualizations of the political, this antagonism can be eliminated by recourse to a consensus producing universal reason. But Mouffe rejects the idea of a universal reason or a natural order or common sense as a product of contingent hegemonic practices. Every rationality is an expression of contingent power relations which favor some and exclude others. So prevailing rationality is not universal, it is merely hegemonic. With that, let me now turn back to the Taliban's rejection of the liberal international order. Armed with most insight that the rationality which resolves antagonism in liberal polities is not universal but hegemonic, we can now consider the possibility that the Taliban is different rather than wrong. Their conception of society and politics is different from us. It appalls us, but we err in dismissing it as wrong. It's not wrong simply because there is no right. There are only competing rationalities. The hegemony of our rationality does not eliminate the possibility of an alternative rationality. From within our rationality, their conceptualization is incomprehensible, but perhaps the opposite is equally true. In simpler terms, what I'm trying to say is, I think it's futile, and here I'm uh, reiterating a point that I think Amal made very well. It's futile to dismiss the Taliban as evil or illegitimate, especially when they're effective control over Afghanistan is clear and uncontested. There's no point in saying that their denial of human rights violates international law, because their conceptualization of inter international relations and law is just entirely different from ours and governed by a completely different logic. To paraphrase um, Daniel Steuer, our law is not their justice. The appeal to the legal form will simply be seen as an attempt to exercise power in another form. In other words, we need to convince the Taliban of the merits of our rationality rather than imposing it upon them. And to do that, we need to engage with them and to avoid the unproductive error of diagnosing their difference as malevolence and illegitimacy. 
Okay, that brings me to the end of the second idea I wanted to talk about, uh, questioning the presumed evilness or illegitimacy of the Taliban. Let me turn now to the final and third idea. Uh, another premise of our discussion is that the UN is a force for good. And I also want to problematize this, but I am conscious of the time, so I will do this very briefly. Um, in a phenomenal recent book, uh, Dina Tsuwala de demonstrates that the post-2003 redemption of Iraq, its reintegration into the international order, was premised on its submission to neoliberal capitalism. Right? This should not come as a surprise to those of us who are familiar with the shortcomings of the Washington Consensus. In a similar way, Jessica White has convincingly demonstrated that the human rights project itself is intrinsically tied to and sustains a neoliberal worldview. And a neoliberal worldview we know is one which is explicitly tied to the maintenance and perpetuation of inequality. In this context, when we look to the UN and Bretton Woods institutions, when we look to the liberal international order as guarantors of the human rights of the Afghan people, what does that really mean? And are we sure that the cure isn't actually comparable to the disease? Um, let me substantiate this with an example from the 2004 Afghan constitution, a constitution which um, was supported by the international presence in Afghanistan, but which we now know failed entirely to correspond to the realities of Afghan society. Uh, I'm not a constitutional expert, but I took a quick look through chapter one, and uh, I saw state obligations to design and implement effective programs for developing industries and agriculture and to adopt necessary measures for provision of housing and for protection of the environment. But as lawyers, we recognize the malleability of concepts such as effectiveness and necessity and the discretion which they allow to the obligor. In contrast to these malleable obligations, in the same chapter, the Afghan state is required to ensure the safety of capital investment and private enterprises in accordance with the provisions of the law and the market economy. So if concrete enforceability is an indicator of a principled hierarchy, then it seems that the 2004 constitution placed more emphasis on protecting foreign investment than it did on protecting Afghan interests. Not only is the protection of the foreign investment far more precise and concrete, but the possibility of sovereign regulation of foreign investment is limited by reference to the requirement of adhering to a market economy, whatever that means. Uh, the same bias seems to be reflected in the chapter on fundamental rights, where there are a handful of socioeconomic rights which are over, uh, overshadowed by an emphasis on civil and political rights and an individualistic socio-political framework um, that is difficult to reconcile with the communitarian society. Okay, with that, let me start summing up. Um, we're having this discussion uh, on the anniversary of the entry into force of the UN Charter on UN Day. The discussion we set out to have is how the UN can intervene in Afghanistan, how to restrict the authoritarianism of the Taliban, how to bring human rights and development to the Afghan people. And we're having this discussion in the context of an unfolding humanitarian disaster. What I'm trying to say is that all of these background factors impose significant constraints on the possibilities of our discourse. The spectacle of violence drives us to immediate action, um, leaving us no time to question the assumed malevolence of the Taliban or the benevolence of the UN. What I've been trying to do in my intervention is to draw attention to these constraints uh, and their role in restricting the scope of our discussion. And I'd, I'd like to say the arguments I presented are not arguments against providing the material assistance that is desperately required in Afghanistan nor is it in any way a defense of the Taliban. Uh, but what I have been trying to argue for is what I think um, B.S. Chimney would call an epistemological and prudent internationalism. Um, an internationalism that is capable of taking into account non-Western forms of knowledge, of deferring to local knowledge and requirements, and one that is capable of engaging with alternative rationalities. Right. Uh, so that's all I have to say, um, thank you for your attention and I look forward to discussing some of these ideas further during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Abhimanyu. It was that, that very well thought out reflection is very well received and it puts a lot of things into a very different perspective, which I'm sure was new for a lot of us in the audience. And taking on from your, what you said, I'd like to invite Ms. Azeen Tajdini, 
to um, because as Abhimanyu also discusses that the international legitimacy of Taliban or its political personality should not be as easily dismissed as probably has been. So, um, Ms. Azim, wh what do you think about uh, the future uh, legal and diplomatic relations of Talibani government with the UN, with other countries and international agencies generally? And what implications will that have for the respective economic, social, uh, human rights in the country? and in the region. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Sorvi, and uh, many thanks to, to you and the other organizers. It's, it's actually very encouraging to see that the next generation of scholars and lawyers um, engage on this very timely issue. Um, and and it, really congratulations for, for creating this panel discussion. Um, I think also I want to say happy UN Day. Uh, as you said in the introduction, um, uh, this is not no small occasion, even if we may discuss the, 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 the impact of the UN, but I think it really is worth thinking about the fact that there is, since 1945, a UN charter, there is a framework for an international uh, rule of law uh, based on uh, some fundamental pillars of peace and security, human rights and development. Um, and uh, it's not about good and bad, but it's simply about having a framework of international law that, that international relations can be based on. Um, and uh, what we have seen unfold in Afghanistan stands in, in stark contrast to this framework, uh, not simply because of the, the actions by the Taliban, but also about how the international community has gone about the situation so far. So it's actually a situation um, that is one of many contradictions. Um, there's a lot of confusion, actually. Um, and just to, to respond to your first question about the, the legal and diplomatic relations with Taliban, and I think in order to say something about this, we first need to ask, uh, what is the Taliban under international law? What does international law say about the Taliban um, as it currently stands? And here I just want to make four points. Um, I'm not going into the history of the Taliban, but simply based on, on the legal framework, we can say that um, the Taliban is an armed non-state actor. Um, it is listed by the UN Security Council as a terrorist organization in several resolutions. Um, and these Security Council resolutions are still valid. Uh, ever since the Taliban came, to, came back as government power, um, these resolutions have not been lifted, even though um, the agreement that actually brought the Taliban to power, so the U.S. agreement with the Taliban from, 19, from 2020, uh, it does contain certain provisions about lifting some of the individual sanctions against certain Taliban officials or Taliban members, uh, but it doesn't say anything about lifting the, lifting the resolutions altogether, and actually that agreement would not have the power to, to say what the Security Council should do. Uh, but just to mention that these Security Council resolutions are still valid, and there are also Security Council resolutions that actually uh, require member states not to support the Taliban or not to support any terrorist organization. So we know that there's an obligation on member states actually by the Security Council, by, by international law, if you consider some of the Council resolutions as international law, not to support the Taliban. So if they do so, they will be in breach of UN Security Council resolutions. So that's the first point. Um, the second maybe characteristic of, of the Taliban is that, well, despite all of this, they're now in government. Um, and uh, they're, they're in government uh, through the third point I want to make, uh, through unconstitutional unconst means. So the, the 2004 constitution um, established the constitutional provisions for uh, change of government. Um, and the way in which the Taliban now is in power is, is contradictory to that legal framework that was in force at that time. So it's an unconstitutional coming to power by this entity, which is now a political force uh, that we have to deal with. Um, and then finally, uh, no state has officially recognized Taliban. Um, it's a gov it, is, it is, as my uh, co-panelist uh, said, um, that uh, it has de facto control. It's, it's prior to becoming the government, it also controlled certain, uh, certain parts of the country. Um, and I think there's another discussion to be had um, later, maybe at, uh, at a later point, but um, how the Taliban actually survived for so long, for 20 years after they were with, uh, overthrown. Um, I think that there are, there are some clear 
uh, questions of international law that should be should be raised about how actually the international community um, uh, work to maintain this non-state armed actor by providing them with the financial means to to survive. Uh, but in any ways, um, no state has officially uh, officially recognized the Taliban, but um, unofficially we have to deal with them because of the great humanitarian crisis. Um, and just in terms of the diplomatic relations, uh, there's, there's one interesting um, um, illustration of how this, these contradictions play out, and, and that's from the, the UN General Assembly, which started in September this year, uh, so the 76th session of the UN uh, General Assembly, because at, uh, in September we saw that the that the, the Afghan ambassador to the UN, so the, the ambassador from the Ghani government, so the pre-Taliban government, um, uh, he and the Taliban made competing claims about who should represent Afghanistan at the UN. So the, the permanent mission of Afghanistan, the ambassador said, we're, the, we're the, uh, the right representatives. The Taliban said, no, it's us. And the decision to, um, about who will represent Afghanistan at the UN, the UN understood as a member state organization, is a decision that uh, is to be made by the UN Credentials Committee. So this is a nine member state committee, so a committee by nine member states, uh, and they're appointed by the General Assembly at the proposal of the president at the beginning of each regular session. So the current members in this committee is Bahamas, uh, Bhutan, Chile, China, Namibia, Russia, uh, Sierra Leone, Sweden, and the U.S. And so, uh, it's in a way, it's, it becomes a very political issue uh, how you reach a recognition of who who is the legitimate representative of a country at the UN. And this uh, credentials committee uh, will hold meeting in normally it's in October or November, uh, and until they make a decision. The, the sitting ambassador will remain in seat. So basically the pre-Taliban representative is the, is the correct representative in a way. However, we, we saw that at the beginning of the GA, uh, the General Assembly, the, the ambassador uh, withdrew his name and nobody spoke for Afghanistan. So, the Afgan so, the, so Afghanistan was not actually uh, represented in the current uh, General Assembly. And just as a point of comparison, actually, um, last, during the last Taliban rule, so from 1996 uh, to 2001, uh, the, the Credentials Committee totally deferred the decision on this point. So, so it was actually the government before, the, before Taliban that had the credentials. So it remains to be seen whether that will be the, the practice this time as well. Um, but I think the more interesting question from from an international law perspective, when it comes to um, representation before the UN is really, um, and it goes back to the contradictions, is whether the UN can give credentials to a government that is, that is listed as a terrorist organization by the UN itself. So because we have these UN Security Council resolutions listing the Taliban as, as a terrorist organization, can actually the UN then say, oh, these representatives are the right ones. That would be in itself a breach of, of valid Security Council uh, resolutions. Um, but um, despite these uh, things, we see that um, because of the humanitarian crisis, um, actually there is a need for intervention financially uh, and through aid. And um, I think even before uh, the Taliban came to power this time around, uh, the UN estimated that at least half the population, so about 15 million, were in need of humanitarian aid, and this number obviously um, is probably much higher now. So in September, actually, the UN uh, convened um, uh, a high-level ministerial meeting for humanitarian uh, assistance to Afghanistan, and member states actually pledged um, something around 1.2 uh, billion uh, U.S. dollars in humanitarian and development aid to, the, to, to Afghanistan. The question is how should this be delivered because um, many of the donors said we're not, we don't want to deliver this to the, to the Taliban because that would in itself also be in breach of not supporting the Taliban through financial means. So this leaves 
other actors. So basically one, one option is actually for the UN to expand or UN agencies. So World Food Program, WHO, um, other, other UN entities to actually take on the role of, of distributing the aid in the country. But in practice, we know that that's, it's very difficult to do that without the, the cooperation of the government. So that remains to be seen actually, how will, how will this humanitarian aid be delivered um, without um, independently of the, of the Taliban? Um, it's, it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see what we know is also that there is an asset freeze on on Afghan um, uh, on on the Afghan central bank, so the Taliban doesn't really have an income or it doesn't have the same access to to money that the previous government had, um, and uh, it remains to be seen if that's going to to continue or um, if they will lift the the asset freezes. Um, maybe I'll stop there and then we can move to move to questions uh, and, and further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Azim. That was really interesting how you put in perspective what kind of diplomatic nuanced battles undertake at the UN, at the very UN itself on representation and giving aid and how actions might be contradictory to Security Council resolutions themselves. Thank you very much. Um, We'd like to now move into the Q&A session and all participants are welcome to send in their questions. We already have a question from Anushka PS and um, I'll read it out and I'd be very happy to have any of the panelists take it up. It reads, the Taliban hit upon a victory that was unforeseen even by them. In this precarious scenario, the Taliban has promised an inclusive government with hundreds of schools for girls and work for women. What makes us assume that the Taliban will not uphold its promise? Um, Abhimanyu, Professor Amal, or Azeen, anyone would like to take it up? I can take a stab at that. Um, so first, I'm not sure that the victory was unanticipated by the Taliban. Um, I think the 2020 agreement with the US and their earlier negotiations were premised on the on the recognition of the Taliban as an effective force in Afghanistan. So just on that, um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I don't think it, we can assume that the Taliban will not hold up its promise. I don't think they will. Uh, I would be very surprised if any of this actually materialized. Um, but I think the general, if I understand, the principled basis of your question, I think you're absolutely right. And obviously based on what I said, I agree that uh, starting from the assumption of the Taliban as an evil or illegitimate actor is I think fundamentally counterproductive. And to the extent that they don't actually follow through on this, um, I think what we need is a more constructive dialogue uh, and where we explain and uh, agitate and uh, build the case for these liberal values rather than imposing them. Uh, I hope that sort of answers your question. Thank you, Abhimanyu. There's another question that I'd like to direct to Professor Amal, which reads, what do you think of the constitution making process in Afghanistan, keeping in mind the various tribal groups that exist there, considering that the Taliban is dominated by the Pashtuns? Um, okay. So I think here we even kind of need to go back to the 2004 process, which where again, you know, um, someone like Hamid Karzai also belonged to the same ethnic community. And there have been a lot of apprehensions that they kind of will, you know, uh, it would result in, you know, and that, so, the, so, okay, let me say this. So when the 2004 constitution was being made, there was this big disagreement, should we go ahead with the presidential system or should we go ahead with the parliamentary system? Uh, now, the Western forces supported a presidential system because they kind of, they were close to Hamid Karzai, they kind of knew Hamid Karzai and uh, the rest of you could say people allied with him and they favored that um, 
as the actor to control Afghanistan. So they also pushed for a presidential system. Now, Hamid Karzai, again, I go back to my point, I see humans are self-motivated actors. He also liked a presidential system because there was a very high probability that in free and fair elections, he would win. So he also supported a presidential system of government, but pretty much no one else who was present. Now it's a different question, how much power people during the constitution making stage, the other actors involved were invited to the Loya Jirka to draft the constitution, how much actual sway they had. None of them actually supported a presidential system for the very simple fear that any presidential system would always result in pretty much a Pashtun leader coming into power. Most of them were more in favor of a parliamentary system. Now, another very interesting uh, kind of fact is that in the global south, since, uh, since the end of the World War, there has not been a single instance of a presidential system that has, in the global south, uh, that has not resulted in at least democratic backsliding at some point. So just very, at just the, at the very basic, let's just even remove the entire issue of cash tones, et cetera. Uh, presidential systems have been very hard to sustain in the global South, in countries without the constitutional culture, the kind of historic constitutional culture that some of some Western democracies have had for centuries, et cetera. So presidential system there to begin in with was a bad idea. So. That's what they advocated for, because now why would someone want a presidential system? Uh, like I said, Karzai and the Western forces supported it because they understood that they could be in power. Uh, now, the Taliban kind of has a very similar model of at least the, their entire government structures also, I mean, even within the so-called uh, de facto government that is being exercised, they have a very similar government structure. So ideally, and the draft constitution that they've kind of created is going to repeat a very similar governance structure, which does exclude other groups. There are some non-Pashtuns who are aligned with the Taliban as a part of that structure, but uh, that's only because they are actually aligned at the end of the day with the Taliban. Uh, I guess, again, normatively, a, a, a constitution needs to involve other groups, um, but I, you know, I, I do want to go back to Abhimanyu's point that a lot of times we we are very quick to dismiss uh, groups like Taliban by calling them terrorist groups, calling them illiberal groups, calling them illegitimate groups. Uh, and this is this is a really interesting research I was undertaking. So I was doing some field work and some semi-structured and interviews with kind of journalists, lawyers, civil society activists uh, before Taliban. Actually, about a year and a half, it's it's an ongoing project. And a year and a half ago, a lot of people didn't like the government in power, and their views for the Taliban were not as extreme as they are today. Now the same conversations with those people kind of have flipped that. So a lot of these things, how this con how really the constitution making process would go on. Like, like I said, my, in, my hunch is that they don't need to, but there's another very important thing that actually happens in constitution making processes is that would the Taliban find a compelling reason to be inclusive? That would really end up being how the Taliban sees that they can effectively control uh, Afghanistan. Uh, in every constitution making sense, it's these kind of, um, I would say domestic dynamics that Taliban is currently the biggest power holder in Afghanistan. So when they really actually end up going and uh, thinking of a long-term governance structure, who they involve and who they don't is really, I think from their point of view, going to boil down to who they think, do they need to kind of engage with? And I'll again, you know, kind of go back to an Indian example to put in more context. Why did the Indian National Congress invite so many other people during the Constituent Assembly? Why did they try to be an inclusive body? It was very simply, they could choose not to. They could have, you know, pretty much uh, drafted a constitution with few of the people who were very integral to the Indian freedom movement, the debates, uh, the negotiations with the British. They could have gone ahead and done that. Pakistan actually did something very similar. They, they actually just did that. They didn't involve everyone. It was Jinnah and his close people that drafted their constitution. But the Indian constitution makers kind of felt that there was some advantage in involving other groups because it serves, it serves a long-term goal. So it's really hard to, you know, kind of, uh, and one thing, you know, 
I, I want to stop doing is like really making predictions about countries like Afghanistan, how they would really move. I have hunches and um, because I mean, I just want to go back to this, that I actually thought, and this is this was that time my hunch that I thought that America would negotiate with the ta- Taliban, then they would get out, and then the Taliban would actually engage in intra-Afghanistan dialogues with the Karzai government. Plus, sorry, with the Ghani government, uh, they didn't support Ghani. It would pa- perhaps lead to Ghani stepping down, and some interim arrangement would have been created where, but apparently that didn't happen. Uh, a lot of people actually shared that view. It was, a, I don't think that was an eccentric view, uh, but that's that it didn't turn out that way so i think a lot of these predictions are very hard to make um as of now it doesn't seem to me that it's going to be super inclusive because there's no need to but it's a very diff it really you you kind of really need to go into the head of like the leaders of Taliban. what what is their plan like going ahead how do they see that this governance structure would kind of operate so i think that's how i'd like kind of sum this thing up Thanks, thanks, Professor. That's very enlightening. Um, um, I'd also like to just ask for a quick follow-up. Do you think international legitimacy would be incentive enough for them to consider being inclusive? Uh, again, I'm not very sure about it. And they here that they you can actually go into a very different. I was on a, another panel recently where someone pointed this kind of interesting thing out which kind of initially Azeen also mentioned it's a very diff- it's a it's a very important question to tackle who is it that how did Taliban manage to survive for 20 years um you know um they they were kind of uh, drawn out from the capital city so there were people who were funding Taliban they were foreign governments they were foreign individuals uh, also like I mentioned uh, opium trade is a big thing in Afghanistan uh, and you know the rise of China in this region. So now they are kind of let's just let's just call them rumors that China does kind of uh, will kind of if not give formal recognition, at least an informal recognition. Uh, there are even talks that China might invest in development act projects into the country. Uh, we are kind of staying in a world where the balance of powers are shifting. So it really depends on uh, you know what kind of side do they want to be with? We can take the North Korea example. Uh, has, has things changed in North Korea? Does international legitimacy matter to them? Sometimes these governments, like Abdul Manu said, that they pretty much are against the very premise of what we, you know, the international legal order, the, uh, the kind of norms that it envisages the world should have. Uh, so a lot would really depend on how, again, they see that, what's the cost benefit and i think it's it's a lot for them to think about uh what the cost benefit is and a lot of people actually saying right now that perhaps they don't need to uh getting they're never going to get a nod of approval from countries like britain us uk these countries internal politics is never going to allow them to do so might as well you know take support from other countries why try to appease countries that are never going to get appeased? Because to really appease them, um, you know, and like we saw that, you know, Abhiman, you pointed out like their con- the Afghanistan constitution actually has very quirky provisions for a country like Afghanistan. Um, there's this there's this amazing article by a scholar called Noah Feldman. It's called Imposed Constitutionalism. And it uses two, it deals with two major examples, Iraq, Afghanistan. But this really uh, this kind of line, which is always stuck by me, where he argues that it's kind of hypocritical to expect. A, so Afghanistan's constitution has a provision which says that they kind of need to sign all uh, major international treaties and make them a part of their law. And during the kind of debates, there was a lot of talk about Afghanistan having to sign CEDAW, et cetera. So Noah Feldman actually says that it's kind of very hypocritical for American. And this a lot of this kind of dialogue was pushed by American civil society activists, uh, some of the American representatives who were sent to draft the constitution. And he says it's so hypocritical that a treaty that America itself has not signed and ratified, you expect Afghanistan to do that. Uh, so, so sometimes, you know, their own, initially their uh, constitution, it's, it's got a lot of things that is not going to work in Afghanistan. So I think, you know, you, you really need to go back to the question that does it really make sense for Afghanistan to follow these things? Does it make sense for the Taliban government if they are going to be in power for the next X, Y, Z years? Uh, what do they see their best interest in? And then the other question that I think 
perhaps is important to answer and perhaps think about is uh, how can you know countries that are important in the UN or perhaps countries that support like a Western worldview, uh, what's the best form of negotiation they can, you know, uh, they can kind of engage in in this process. So Noah Feldman also argues something which Abhimanyu said that it's, you know, you can't impose these uh, values onto countries like Afghanistan. You need to kind of tell them that a lot of these things are good for you. Uh, you have to, you know, these things only get materialized uh, when, you know, domestic actors who are governing the country want to do it. Uh, and again, going back to like the kind of constitution you know putting things in the constitution actually don't there is now enough empirical research that putting a term in a constitution doesn't change government behavior like absolutely at all uh, that a great book out by two scholars called Mila Verstegger Adam Chilton is called How Constitutional Right Matters it's perhaps the most latest on this book and they've also found this that um, governments only enforce constitutional terms when it makes sense to them um, so yeah, we can put things in the constitution. We can, you know, try to draft an inclusive constitution, but it's it's really a lot of this is just going to come down to where Taliban sees a benefit. And it will be for like, you know, international actors or whoever wants to have a stake in this whole debate to kind of put forward a point that this benefits you in some way or another. Absolutely. Thanks very much. It's a very practical and useful perspective on thinking or venturing, if at all, into predicting about what the future state of affairs in the Taliban control of Afghanistan might look like. Um, there's a question which I'd, uh, which uh, for Ms. Azim, it says that um, while you spoke about asset freezes um, how the, and how the international community has interacted with non-state Taliban, uh, but now as a national power, how do you think the UN and the other international agencies will interact with it, especially because now the question of development projects, untapped economy will come into force and if I may add, uh, political, social, um, and economic rights of the people as well will come into picture if the UN is continuously neglecting what's happening and sort of turning its head away because sanctions are often tend to only affect the very sort of deprived people within a country as well. So how do you think the UN should and will interact with the government now? Thank you, and, and, and thank you for the, for the question. Um, I think um, one thing to to bear in mind is that a lot of, as I as I mentioned, is that um, a large part of the of the pre-Taliban economy was was international, uh, was through international aid, um, uh, including salaries of, of government officials. This was all. Most of this was actually paid by 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 the UN or by member states through different kind of constellations. Um, what the UN will do, I, I don't want to speculate, but um, it, it's clear that if if there's no um, if, if this aid doesn't continue, then um, uh, the, the state will fall collapse uh, already. So people will not have um, will not have an income. Uh, the medical system, hospitals, everything will will really collapse. So the question for the UN and for member states is really to find viable. Um, a, a sustainable way in this, at least in this initial period, to make sure that the aid um, reaches uh, Afghanistan and its people, um, and how it can do that through the with the asset freeze uh, in place. Um, uh, well, that's going to be challenging. So at some point, I think there will be a need to lift it. I think the the question is how to lift the asset freeze without violating. Um, uh, existing resolutions, so they would need to change the resolutions probably before they can they can um, uh, unblock the money uh, in order to do this in a in a way that is legal. Uh, but I just wanted to to mention one thing um, in view of the previous uh, questions, um, and that is the I think um, it, it, it's very easy to presume that um, uh, that Western values, as some call them. Um, was something alien to Afghanistan. I, I think if we look back at the constitutional history uh, of Afghanistan in the 20th century, um, a lot of rights uh, were achieved and they were, they were entrenched and the society was based on those values. Um, and um, it's, it's also easy to dismiss, I think, Afghanistan as a failed state. It's, it's not. 
Um, I think if, again, if we look at what it was and how it developed from 1900s and onwards, um, it really, um, uh, it, it is a state and it, it was a state with institutions. It was a state with um, individual rights, um, not, not fully uh, as, we, as we know them today, but at least they, uh, they were in the, in the pro, they, they uh, were in development. So uh, I think um, uh, one, one caution is really to, to think that Taliban, Taliban is, is not the same as the Afghan people. So just because the Taliban <laughs> has a certain idea of what, what kind of constitution uh, the country should have, doesn't mean that this is in line with the mentality of, of the Afghan population. No, they, they, they know a different um, past. Uh, and I think um, the, the views on what kind of society they want to build is very diverse as well. Um, and I think the UN has, uh, or, or the international community at least has a, has a role to play in making sure that those voices are heard too, not just the Taliban voice. Um, and I think one of the shortcomings of the past constitution, the one from 2004, where, when the UN was involved, um, and clearly the UN was, uh, was involved as a member state, and we can speculate in the intentions of the different member states involved in that process, but I think one of the shortcomings is the duality that the constitution actually created, because on one hand, it's a, uh, it has all these modern concepts. It has, you know, separation of powers, rule of law, um, different types of rights, uh, adherence uh, to international instruments. At the other side, um, there's a very strong fundamentalist um, uh, part of the constitution, which basically gives religion and, and a, a, a big role. And this is also part of, I think, what, what kept certain conservative um, forces in power in these 20 years because the constitution was not actually created to get rid of um, those forces in society. It actually gave them a lot more space than they um, had had in, in certain parts of Afghan history. So I think that's a big lesson for also the international community to, to, um, uh, to think about uh, when it thinks about how to get involved and which voices it actually allows to be heard in this in this process. Absolutely, thank you so much, Ms. Azim. That's very important perspective as well on going back to sort of investigating our assumptions on what or what is alien or not inherent to a country is in despite, like in light of like popular perceptions. Um, but in the interest of time, I'd like to now invite um, brief closing comments by the panelists, if any, before I hand it back to the organizers. And there's one question, if which could be in the answer to which could, could be incorporated in the closing comments would be very helpful. And it reads, how much can the dichotomy between practical political control and the legitimacy of Taliban's power can really be stressed upon by the UN? Um, Abhimanyu, would you like to take the floor? Sure. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, let me pull it up. How much can the dichotomy be practical political control? Uh, so I think about the, I, I conceptualize this as a tension, as an almost dialectical tension between practical control and uh, legitimacy. And how far you veer towards one or the other, uh, I think is a function of how much or how little the UN and the rest of the world want from Afghanistan. I don't know, I think there was another question uh, from Priya uh, about how do we balance out individual national interest with the global interest. And again, I think, um, one fact that hasn't really come up, uh, and I don't have all of the facts on this, but uh, I seem to recall reading that uh, there are important rare earth minerals in fairly large quantities that have recently been discovered in Afghanistan. Um, that kind of changes things a little bit, right? Because uh, those are commodities that we need quite badly, and by the end, I mean nationally really large. Uh, and so, in the dialectic between 
effective control and uh, legitimacy, uh, the presence of an important resource that the rest of the world wants access to sh shifts the scale in the, towards the site. Um, so I think, again, like Amal and Azim have already said it, I don't want to, um, especially with Afghanistan, it's not a great idea to make predictions. But I think an interesting dynamic which is unfolding is um, the sort of post-liberal international order that China and Russia are trying to establish uh, is coming up against the existing Western liberal international order quite specifically in Afghanistan. And if we think about at least the news that we read about Afghanistan, uh, China through Pakistan trying to tie Afghanistan into the one brick one road initiative. Um, and so I don't know the answers to these questions, but I think whatever, however these things work out, I think the answer lies in, unfortunately, in the natural, natural resources that Afghanistan uh, has unfortunately recently been found to have. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Amal, do you like to okay. make any closing remarks? I'll build on to some, some very important points as he had mentioned. And I like as quickly as possible address three of them. And, you know, so one very interesting thing that Azim mentioned was that a lot of, it's not like some of these values that we talk about have, haven't existed in the Afghan society. Now there's there's this article I really like by Mark Wiesender called Enlightened Constitutionalism. It speaks about how even within society and even historically, there've always been voices of dissent. There've always been, uh, you know, there have always been called for certain you know, values. So that's one point. And that's just, that's the thought to keep in mind. But the second thing is actually more important. Afghanistan in 2001 was completely destroyed. Uh, years of wars completely destroyed it. But from 2001, when the peace building process started to now, it's actually made remarkable strides. Uh, people in Afghanistan are used to a different world now. Uh, and like I mentioned that a lot of times how power holders do things, it's, they do things in accordance with what's really needed for them to stay power. So the, the one kind of optimism we can take from all of this is that today, Afghan people in Afghanistan have seen a different world. Uh, perhaps they don't want to go back to it. There's a lot of power in what people of that country want, and you can only suppress it by force to some extent. So there's some optimism there that it might kind of force Taliban to moderate a bit. Again, we can't predict, but that's that's a that's kind of an optimism to look out to. And the third thing, you know, it's unrelated to these things, perhaps might not be a closing statement as well, but it again goes into the nature of constitution making. Azin had mentioned one very important point that it wasn't that the 2004 constitution was all liberal. It had a lot of liberal provisions, which were kind of put, kind of, you would you could say forced in by, um, if that's the term uh, someone would want to use by Western forces, but it also gave a lot of room for conservative actors to operate. And I think the best example is the Supreme Court. Uh, Hamid Karzai wanted to make a constitutional court, a separate constitutional court, because the, the Afghan legal system was completely in the hands of ulemas who were trained in the Sharia law, etc. And they were the ones who ran the Supreme Court. So the initial draft of the constitution actually had a separate constitutional court, which would completely reform the system. But Hamid Karzai, he needed support from this particular, you could say, a conservative power bloc. Uh, which involved, which also, uh, which kind of also involves certain jurists who are uh, affiliated with some of the legal system in Afghanistan. So he kind of stuck a back to a back to a deal that they chuck the the idea of constitutional court. They'll actually retain the Supreme Court and give it more powers than it actually had under its the previous so-called uh, legitimate constitution. And we will let it be the way it is. Over years, what's happened is the Supreme Court keeps pa passing these ultra conservative decisions all the time. Another, you know, kind of um, actor in the society that um, has allowed these conservative kind of voices to exist. But it's always had a quick pro quo relationship 
with the presidency. It's always a, the, there's a lot of fight between the presidency and the legislator, but it's always supported the presidency. And the presidency, even though people like Amit Karzai, Ashraf Ghani, they are people who are aligned with Western values. They've allowed the Supreme Court to sustain. And these are very important dynamics that play out in constitution making. So again, you know, when when all things are said and done, a lot of the, it's it's really going to matter how these kind of dynamics play out, and who, who is it that Taliban would need to negotiate with when they try to you know carve out this the future for Afghanistan. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thanks very much for those comments, and I'd like to now invite uh, Azim for her final comments. Thank you, Sorbi. I, I actually don't have much to add, uh, apart from what my co-panelists um, have, have raised in, in their closing remarks, uh, which I agree with. Um, I think um, between, the, between effective control uh, and legitimacy, I think um, the role of the international community, whether it's through uh, the UN or whether it's bilaterally, I think maybe I, I don't want to aim too high, but <laughs> maybe one thing that I wish to see is is really damage control. I think um, uh, at least not to not to 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 act in a way that is in accordance with um, with the UN Charter, uh, first of all, but also um, not to empower uh, destructive forces. And I think uh, one of one of the things we saw in Afghanistan, we saw it also in Iraq, um, is that despite on paper. Um, Many countries uh, supported the, the, the sort of democratic uh, govern democratic governance and de democratic governments uh, behind the scenes, whether through financial support or other form of support. They also uh, empowered uh, more destructive forces. So I think if if I can have one wish, especially on on, on the UN days, that um, the, this is changed. Um, of course, in real politics, that's. Uh, a very big wish to make, but but I think um, if we want to see a change for Afghanistan, um, I think we have to start there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azim. Um, I'd like to now hand over the floor to the organizers, but I'm confident as I, that I speak on behalf of a lot of participants that I, had, I learned a lot in this conversation, and thanks everyone. Um, Sidam? Yeah, thank you so much, Sarvi, for moderating the session. I think it really helped structure the session into a very coherent discussion. Um, and on behalf of the Council for International Relations and International Law and the Law and Society Committee of NLS, I would like to thank the panelists for coming here and raising the occasion of UND and this discussion as well. Given the discourse in the past month or so, it was almost mandatory for us to have this discussion and uh, we are really grateful that you were able to come here and shed light on the matter. And I think I speak for all attendees here in saying that it is really refreshing to hear all the perspectives that you portrayed here and also allowed us to take a step back and question a lot of assumptions that we as students were working with when we listen to the media and the kind of articles we read. So that was really helpful in enriching the discussion that we had understood until now. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you so much for coming and attending this panel session. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank you. staying until the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.